la paix qu'on a, la paix chez l'icône. There was a lot of anger and hatred about the past system. If it was in Matiba, I'm sure it, we were not going to have that. We will be still be having that anger. And On 18th July 1918, a child who would later become the champion of freedom in South Africa and a celebrated hero the world over was born in the countryside of Mvezo, a tiny village in Transkei. Transkei is situated 800 miles east of Cape Town. Rolihlahla Mandela, the son of a chief, Gadla Henry Mpakanyiswa, acquired his Christian name, Nelson, on his first day of school. Rolih Lakla in Kosa literally means pulling the branch of a tree, but its colloquial meaning accurately would be troublemaker. Mandela did not grow up in an environment with normal parenthood, and later, his involvement in politics took a toll on his private life. He had to make hard choices including choosing between family life and fighting for the freedom of the bigger nation. He has been married three times, has fathered six children, has 20 grandchildren and a growing number of great-grandchildren. His first marriage was to Evelyn Massey in 1944. The couple had two sons and two daughters. But the marriage broke up in 1957 after 13 years, not by choice, but due to Mandela's involvement in politics while the wife was devoted to religion. Mandela's second wife was Winnie Madikizela. They had two daughters, Zeni and Zinzi. This is Winnie and Zeni before Mandela's imprisonment. The marriage ended in separation in 1992 and divorce in 1996. On his 80th birthday in 1998, Mandela entered his third marriage with Grasa Machel, widow of Samora Machel, former Mozambican president who died in a mysterious plane crash. And here is Mandela the boxer at an early age. The real dark days of apartheid began in 1948 following the election victory of the Africana-dominated National Party. As segregation and oppression prevailed, Mandela was prominent in the ANC's 1952 defiance campaign and the 1955 Congress of the People, whose adoption of the Freedom Charter provided the fundamental program of the anti-apartheid cause. During this time, Mandela and his fellow lawyer Oliver Tambo operated the law firm of Mandela and Tambo, providing free legal services to many blacks who would otherwise have been without representation. That history is preserved in the Apartheid Museum in Johannesburg, among other places. The museum preserves a collection of memories of segregation and the steps Mandela and others took on the road to freedom, as explained by Emilia Portenza, education and exhibition consultant for the museum. What you can see here in front of you is a cage-like structure that we've used in this section of the museum to show how people's lives were constrained and controlled by a whole lot of laws, 151 laws that controlled every aspect of people's lives. Mm -hmm. This is a medical inspection taking place in the mines. Um, when people are coming, migrant laborers from all over Southern Africa are coming to work on the gold mines in South Africa. On December the 5th, 1956, Mandela was arrested with 150 others and charged with treason. The treason trial took five years, but they were all eventually acquitted. Ahmed Katrada, a former prison mate of Mandela, who became his political advisor during his presidency, was among those who faced the trial. 
On March the 21st, 1960, a group of ANC members broke away and formed the Pan-Africanist Congress, PSC. When Mandela was underground, he, organized, he uh, uh, was the leading figure in organizing a strike, 1961. And never in the history of South Africa was so much force being mobilized to crush that strike. That is when Mandela from underground had made the famous statement that a new chapter has now been opened in our struggle. He didn't use these words, but he, he meant that we must now review this whole question of non-violent struggle. While the political struggle remains the struggle, main struggle, but we must now switch to a, an armed struggle. And that was the birth of Mkonto Vesizwe. Umkonto Wesizwe, normally abbreviated as MK, means the spear of the nation. It was the armed wing of the ANC, and the struggle was a collective initiative. Volunteers had to be trained in the manufacture and planting of bombs. These places were targeted for bombing. But under the discipline of the ANC, the, the, uh, the oath had to be taken. Every volunteer had to take an oath to abide by the policy. And that is when you plant bombs, you don't hurt human beings. Mandela was smuggled out of the country in 1962 for military training. He went to Tanganyika, which is now Tanzania, Senegal, Algeria, Tunisia and Ethiopia among other countries. In Ethiopia, he addressed a meeting of the Organization of African Union and went back to Johannesburg secretly via Zambia and Botswana. Mandela's job was to go to these countries and get their support for the arms struggle. So we got our arms from the communist countries. Training, the main training is from the communist countries and then of course a lot of people were trained in, a, in, 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 in a camps uh, in Africa. Mandela himself was trained there, you see, when he was illegal. So when he returned to South Africa, he was arrested. He was arrested. Africa. He was convicted of incitement and leaving the country illegally and was sentenced to five years in jail. Upon that conviction, he shouted Amandla three times to his supporters in the public gallery, who responded by singing Nkosi Sikeleli Africa, meaning God Save Africa, a song that later became South Africa's national anthem. Mandela was sent to Robben Island and put to hard labor. He was later sent back to Pretoria to stand trial with other members of Umkonto Wesizwe after police raided a farm in Rivonia, Pretoria, where the armed wing held secret meetings. For the first time, we were all kept together in one cell. But before that, it was single cells. And they told us that they're putting us in, in one cell because uh, we've got food from home. You must finish the food because from tomorrow you'll be eating jail food. Still in the footsteps of Mandela, I got a chance to visit these prison cells at the Old Fort Prison. It's called Prison Number 4. And it reminded me of Mandela saying in his Long Walk to Freedom book that no one knows a nation until one has a chance to visit its jails. Mandela, meanwhile, was being confined in a different room adjacent to the solitary confinement cells where his colleagues would stay. I only knew when I left jail <laughs> because I used to go under a tree and, uh, and then I relax there, think I'm free, and yet I had a microphone in the trees. In the tree. <laughs> This is now a national monument where one finds samples of torture tools, including the flogging frame, that were being used by the oppressors. My colleagues 
because they were African, did not get bread. I got, when I say I, all Indian and colored prisoners got a quarter loaf of bread every day. They didn't get bread. The memories in prison are preserved at the Mandela Prison Archive based at the Nelson Mandela Foundation in Johannesburg. It includes his diaries, rare photographs and video footage, Mandela's handwritten letters to his family, friends and authorities. These are actually the originals because what he would do is he would write these letters out in the book first because although he would give the letters to be posted they had to go through the census of the prison and sometimes they actually what we've discovered is a lot of these letters actually were never received by the people for whom they were meant because the censors would just take them and they wouldn't even tell him that the letters had never been sent well at first we were allowed to write and receive letters once in six months and uh but of course we fought against that uh, for quite some time and, uh, and the methods we used, they really could not tolerate and uh, so we eventually won the battle. This photograph was taken during a visit by a journalist to Robben Island in 1977, captioned a prisoner working in the garden. Political prisoners were required to garden or stage managed during media visits. I had a garden which I look after and looked after. And uh, when the tomatoes were ready, the warders would be very friendly yes. and come and get some tomatoes from the garden. Although removed from public eye, the imprisoned Mandela maintained powerful connections with the wider world. Meanwhile, the oppressors could not weather the pressure from the international community amid increasing internal defiance by Mandela's supporters. They called Madiba, the authorities. They said, we are prepared to exempt you. Exempt you, we'll give you, you know, the clothes that uh, other people have got, we'll give you the same food or even better food, exemption from work. He refused. After three years, Madiba was separated from us alone. So the four of us stayed alone. When Madiba was separated from us, that is when he took the first step towards talking to the other one, to the enemy. Because our policy was always, we must have a negotiated settlement. If we have a violent victory, there are three, three million whites who are South Africans. It's not as if there were just a few hundred Three million whites at that time, now there are more. So you can't drown three million whites. Mandela's demands as negotiations went on included the release of political prisoners, the repeal of the ban on political organizations, and allowing exiles to return home. Then President F.W. de Klerk made a rather unpopular move among the whites, a bold move that saw him bite the bullet and set the pace for a democratic South Africa. Order. Order. I wish to put it plainly that the government has taken a firm decision to release Mr. Mandela unconditionally. I'm serious. I'm serious about bringing this matter to finality without delay. The government will take a decision soon on the date of his release. It was the most extraordinary time of our lives. Mandela. And Mandela was everything and more than we could ever have expected. You know, everybody anticipated that he could never live up to Where were you at that time? How did you I was it? living in Cape Town. I was waiting on the Grand, Grand Parade, which mm. is where he first appeared after his release from Victor Fester prison. 
And we waited and waited and waited the whole day. There were delays in him getting there to address us. And it was very tense because the police were shooting rubber bullets from behind to try and control the crowd. And you weren't sure whether you were safe, but none of us were moving. We wanted to see Madiba. The first free elections in South Africa took place in April 1994 and the Madiba magic surfaced. He charmed the world as the rainbow nation was being born. Women like this had waited their whole lives to vote and queues snaked like this around polling stations. I mean, uh, these yes. areas, this is a queue. Voting a queue this is vote, a voting, eh? queue. Okay, voting queue. Look at that. Mm -hmm. All determined. And, it, and, yeah. and sharp photographs like this were taken all around the country. And because of some difficulties with the process, um, there were delays. And some people had to wait two, sometimes even three days to cast their votes. After overcoming segregation, South Africa has thrived through collective leadership, attained partly through bargaining. The national anthem, God Save Africa, is always a reminder of triumph over politics of exclusion. When you have problems, I mean, it's an easy person that you can go to and say that I have this problem. He will feel for you as a father, you know. You know, you don't take him like he's your leader and, you know, take the position that he's a, 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 he was a state president and then you fear. He's just a humble person, but strict, strictness, it's there. Never and never again shall it be that this beautiful land will again experience the oppression of one by another. The sun shall never set on so glorious a human achievement. Let freedom reign. God bless Africa.